All right, we're looking forward to uh, some good things coming up in the future, and so we want to talk about those. One is not going to be an undefeated season. That's not a good thing. But uh, anyway, we're looking forward to some good things. But uh, all right, uh, we, have, we have some things coming up. One is, of course, I need to remind you, and that's in the bulletin, that the revival is canceled. You remember that? We intended to begin that this Thursday through next Sunday with Sam Davison, but because of his emergency surgery, he's unavailable. So we'll continue to pray for him. As far as I know, he's recuperating well. And so I did receive a call from him from the hospital while he is in recovery, and things are going good. So we'll continue to pray for him. We do have, beginning this Wednesday, we have at, on this Wednesday, we have a, uh, uh, a uh, kickoff for the... Uh, Patch the Pirate program and the Ignite program, our youth programs, on Wednesday night. We're calling it a back-to-school bash. There'll be all-you-can-eat pizza for the young people. So remember that. Let folks know about it. There are flyers available. If you have some young people that live near you that you know of or maybe across town that you know of that you want to let them know about this great program on Wednesday nights through the school year, uh, get a flyer from uh, Pastor Josh or Brother Cliff, and uh, let them know about this uh, big party that we're having this Wednesday to get it all restarted now that school's back in. Looking forward to a great event there with the Patch Program and the Ignite Program for the youth. Uh, we are having some meetings tonight after the evening service. I need a meeting with all of the super church workers, everybody in the super church and bus workers. All of those, I need to meet with you tonight right after the evening service. We have some scheduled things that we need to work on and some details, so please uh, join me with, with me on that. The Harvest Party workers, September the 24th, that's a few weeks away. We'll tell you more about that in the future. Uh, we have Brother Ron Winter that's going to be here with us tonight uh, preaching for us. He's a missionary that we've supported uh, almost the entire time that they've been missionaries to Mexico. Uh, he's been down there doing a great job. We even had a missions trip to his uh, work down there some years ago. Great guy. I've known him forever. Love him and his wife who passed away last year. And uh, he'll be here with us this evening preaching for us. So plan on that. That'll be a great time and, and uh, seeing him again and hearing his testimony. Also, uh, we continue the Love in Action on Saturdays. Had a great time yesterday with our first of the three. We uh, met yesterday here at 10 o'clock, went out and knocked doors uh, in Salina, had a great time with that, distributed packets of the gospel with John and Romans and tracts and uh, flyers about different programs in the church and witness to people. I got to witness to a man for quite a while yesterday, had a great time with that. He's supposed to be here in church this morning. I don't see him, but uh, hopefully he'll come in the future, but uh, had a great time with that. We're meeting again this Saturday, 10 o'clock, the 16th. And then the following Saturday, the 23rd, our goal is to knock every door on the west side of Salina, inviting folks to church, witnessing the gospel. And so you join us on that. If you don't know exactly what to say, we can carry you with someone that does. And we'll have a great time with that uh, the next two Saturdays. Also, uh, we're looking forward to uh, good things. Well, I've already covered that, the Ignite, Ignite and the Patch Club. So uh, pray for God's blessings on all of that, all right? All right, I'll ask the ushers to come and we'll receive the offering this morning. Give you an opportunity to worship the Lord with your tithes and your offerings. Part of our worship of God is giving back some of what He's given to us. Ushers, you may receive the offering. <laughs>
provision. And Lord, I pray that now this offering might reflect, Lord, our love to you, our recognition of your ownership of everything, our desire for your blessings upon us, even financially. Lord, you know we depend upon finances. Lord, we pray your blessings upon those that give. May God, you do as you promise, and you do. Giving back, good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to introduce a guest that we have with us today, Brother Tom Wojnarowski. He's going to come and sing for us in a moment. I've known this guy since we were kids. Uh, his parents had been members of the church that uh, I was a member of, grew up in, in Cleveland, the Cleveland Baptist Church. And uh, his dad went into ministry, and, and so my dad was involved with that, and we were around each other a lot as kids. And uh, his wife as well, Joy, came to the Cleveland Baptist Church about 1976, 77, something like that. They got married after they met there, and uh, uh, I've enjoyed this man's friendship for a long time, Brother Tom. My brother and I just love them, enjoy their friendship, and uh, actually his dad uh, was an evangelist, still is, and uh, his health is getting shaky, but uh, he preached here back in the early 70s, and Brother Cliff was telling me that uh, the church was packed and had a bunch of folks here, and I think that was the Sunday Brother Cliff said Ed Waldron came and got saved, and so uh, his dad played the accordivox, which is an amplified, amplified accordion. Does a great job with it, played it and sang, and uh, and preached, and he's such a whirlwind when he preaches, it almost is threatening to his health. We talked about that yesterday, and the family's just telling him, yeah, that his dad, that he's just going to have to slow down on his uh, preaching, you know, because he just gets so wound up, but he's a great guy, I tell you, a great family, and so glad to have Tom and Joy with us here today, and Tom and Joy work now in Cleveland, he's been a pastor, been involved in ministry. And uh, we're glad to have him come and minister to us today through song. So come, to Tom, come and, and sing for us. Glad to have you, buddy. And Joy's going to accompany him on the piano. Good morning. Good morning. I am so thrilled to be here. I, I, I'm not trying to start this off on, on a negative tone here, but... <clears throat> I, I regret that so many years have gone by that we haven't had fellowship together, Steve. And uh, we saw each other about a month ago in Cleveland, and it was it was a shock to both of us in the circumstances we found ourselves in. It happened to be at a ball game, and uh, we, uh, Steve contacted me a short while later and asked me to come sing and have some fellowship with, with him and his wife. And we are just thrilled to be here. You can't uh, understand how encouraged I am. After, after a lot of circumstances that you invited me here. And so I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm blessed. And uh, I'm thinking also about uh, just, just the way life beats us hard, the storms of life, thinking about the actual storm that's hitting Florida. And I have a son that lives there in Tampa, and uh, I understand Stephen Land has a daughter there as well. And, uh, you know, life hits us in, in many different ways, and it, it's tough. And I thank God that one day we'll be home with the Lord. Amen? Amen. What a great day that will be when we finally can say, we're finally home. Amen. When engulfed by the terror of tempestuous seas, unknown waves before you roll, at the end of doubt and peril is eternity. Though fear and conflict seize your soul. But just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God.
surrounded by the blackness of the darkest night. Oh, how lonely death can be. At the end of this long tunnel is a shining light, for death is swallowed up in victory. But just think, of stepping on shore and finding it heaven of touching a hand and finding it God's of breathing new air and finding it celestial of waking up in glory and finding
takes away the sins of the world. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. He takes away the sins of the of the world lifted up was he to die it is finished was his cry now in heaven exalted high he takes away the sins of the Brother Tom 
Tom's dad, Marion, my dad and, and Marion played that game, Christmas Day. He said, hey, let's, let's play this. And you guys had not played that ever yet. And so uh, they got going on this game, and man, I mean, they got into it. They got this game going. They was getting rowdy, you know, and all us kids were running around hollering, playing, having a good time, you know. And uh, they got right down there where the clock was running out or something. I can't remember, but the last play of the game, my dad's guy with the football zigzagged all the way through and scored a touchdown, and dad won the game. And Marion Wojnarowski was so mad, he went, whoop, bam, and threw his fist right down the middle of that electric football game. And ruined it, bashed it, ruined the thing forever. When you turn it on, all the players would just go right to the middle. <laughs> That was the end of the ball game. <laughs> great memory for me. Hilarious. <laughs> well, we've had a great time together over the years. Look forward to more of that in the future. Huh? Well, not exactly like that. More good times. <laughs> but uh, I want to preach to you this morning out of Acts chapter 24. And the book of Acts is an exciting uh, book, an exciting uh, account of the church exploding into growth and the witness of the gospel exploding into growth throughout the world. And uh, Paul the Apostle, of course, one of the main figures in the latter half of the book. And uh, this is uh, the story of Paul the Apostle. And uh, it, kind of, uh, it kind of reminds me of the storm that's going on down in Florida. I mean, there's some similarities here that I'll uh, mention as we go through. Uh, the storm in Florida, of course, a massive hurricane. And uh, my brother used to pastor in Marathon uh, Key, Florida, which is in the middle of the Keys, where the Hurricane Eye is now, right now. And uh, I remember talking to some of those guys down there years ago, and they said, uh, man, we haven't had a hurricane in a long time, and it's actually good for the fishing. And I remember asking them, what? And they said, yeah, it stirs it up. And, uh, you know, a hurricane's needed once in a while. To stir up the, the bottom of the ocean and just to, I don't know exactly how it all works, but they said it's good for the fishing and they hadn't had one in a long time. They did get some later, of course, but the, the fishing ought to be real good now in the days to come, right? Really good. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you saw this, but on the, on the web, I saw a video Joe showed me this morning, told me about it. I went on and looked at it. The Bahamas, in the Bahamas, the ocean is gone. Did you see that? You can get on the internet and look that up. The water has been sucked away from the Bahamas. They walk out on the docks and jump down on the ground and walk out where the water used to be. That's how powerful this storm is. It's sucking water from around the other parts of the Caribbean into that storm. And of course, it's probably going to push it into the land there in Florida. So this could be an unusual event. Isn't it interesting that God has allowed a hurricane a week ago Harvey in Houston, and now this week Irma in Florida. Amazing, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know if there's some spiritual significance or not. I know one thing. Houston, I, I think I'm correct on this, some not many years ago, elected a lesbian mayor and uh, is a place of much uh, immorality and, and uh, uh, perversion and uh, I know Key West has been also for a long time. Amen. I, I used to call it Queer West. I mean, it's just literally uh, the same thing. And so, who knows? Who knows what's going on? I don't know. I can't make any judgments. I'm, that's not my position. I can only guess. But I know somebody said that Harvey and Irma need to get married and go on a honeymoon to North Korea. That's what they need to do. <laughs> and we need to send them both over there. <laughs> but, uh, regardless, uh, we're praying that God's blessings be upon at least the good people, at least in Florida. And uh, I don't know what God's doing, but uh, that's His business. Amen. And uh, we'll just trust the Lord. And hopefully, America recognizes that we need God more than ever. Amen. Amen. Maybe that'll be one of the things that uh, we seem so secure. We're rich and increased and good with goods and have need of nothing, right? And uh, we don't realize that we're poor and miserable and blind and naked. Amen. And we're, we're in great need of God. And so hopefully that will be at least one of the lessons learned through all of this. 
But I want to show you a storm that's going on here in, spiritually in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 24. If you can, stand with me and let me read a couple of scriptures to you. Before I read these, I'll set these up because I'm not going to read the whole chapter. But I want you to see that Paul here, this, this passage is about Paul and his ministry. He has returned to Jerusalem. He's been on missionary journeys throughout this uh, part of Asia. And uh, now he's returned to Jerusalem knowing that he would uh, possibly suffer arrest and imprisonment. And it did happen. Uh, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, hated Paul. They hated his gospel as well as some of the Jews who had been in other places and heard him preach and knew of him stirred the people up uh, in Jerusalem against him. Uh, he's been arrested in prison, and now in Acts chapter 24, he's before the council. He's, uh, the religious leaders have brought him before their council, and uh, he, uh, uh, he stirred them up with some statements uh, uh, about religious beliefs, and they beat him, uh, and then he was rescued by a Roman uh, a guard and taken to prison. Now he's brought to Caesarea which is north of Jerusalem, to stand before the governor. He is eloquently accused by Tertullus, an eloquent lawyer for the high priests and elders, of being, uh, according to their words, a pestilent and seditious fellow, and a ringleader of profaners of the temple, which of course is not true, uh, greatly exaggerated in the lie. He's worshiping the Lord, and he claims that in this chapter. And... Uh, after he makes his own statements and defends himself before this governor, Felix, uh, we see then the response uh, here by Felix. In Acts chapter 24, verse number 24, notice this. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. I want you to notice that Felix decided to hear Paul's uh, defense and his position. Felix was not ignorant of Judaism, or nor was he ignorant of Christianity. The Bible says that previously in this chapter. He was familiar with this. He being the governor of this area had dealt with this already. The religious leaders, of course, who were in charge there uh, locally, but then also Christianity, which he had dealt with and uh, had, had dealings with. He was familiar with it, so he wanted to hear what Paul had to say. And so he, he uh, arranged for that to happen. And his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess, she knew, of course, the Old Testament law, having been raised in it, knew of Christianity, so they decided, hey, we're going to hear this. Let's hear what this guy has to say. He seems to be uh, well-spoken, and uh, let's hear what he has to say about uh, this Jesus Christ. And so they did. They sat and listened to him. And the Bible says they reasoned together of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And the result of that was that Paul was able to give them the gospel. Of course, Paul was uh, uh, with the gospel was like a uh, gunslinger in the Old West with his gun. He was always ready to pull the trigger. Right? Always ready. Always ready. Even at the peril of his own life, which eventually he didn't lose because of the Gospel. He was always ready to give the Gospel to anybody that would listen. And uh, he did. He gave Felix here the truth of the Gospel and uh, preached to him. And they reasoned of this. They talked about it. They debated this. They, they hashed it out here. Who knows for how long. And the result was that Felix said, you know what, I, I'm interested in this, but uh, I, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to think about this, and I'm not going to decide about this today. I, I'm going to do it some other time, and I'll call for you when I'm ready. And Paul, uh, Paul was able to give him the gospel, but Felix's answer was an answer that I've received many times from people that I've witnessed to. I hear what you're saying. I think it might be good. But I'm not going to decide today. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. That's what I'm going to preach on tonight or this morning. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray to you this morning, Lord, that you would guide us and help us now here today. Lord, may we recognize the truth of your word and the importance of the opportunity that we have. Give me the words to say, Lord. Help me to preach something that will be valuable to those here in this room. And even those watching online, God, may all of us recognize the truth of your word, the importance of the right decision at the right time. Help us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. My daughter and son-in-law live in Bradenton, Florida, which is south of Tampa. And uh, this storm, of course, has upset their lives. And the news broadcast has been that this storm is a monster, and it is massive, massive hurricane. So because of it, they've decided to move. They live along the Manatee River, which is only 10 feet above sea level in Bradenton. And so they're fearful that the surge would swamp their house. And so they left, they went to Orlando. They're familiar with that place. They have the ability to get a room there. They did. Orlando's 90 feet above sea level. They figured that might be a safer spot. Of course, Wednesday, they went to Disney World while they were waiting. But they're there now in, in Orlando awaiting the storm. And the people in, in my son-in-law's business were panicked Wednesday about getting out. And uh, so they did. Well, my son-in-law, some of his family, decided they were going to stick out the storm, and they stayed in their house at home. Well, that changed yesterday. They all said, you know what? We don't think it's a good idea. The storm's coming right this way. We think maybe we better come your way. And so now some of his family are trying to cram into that hotel room with them in order to be able to ride out the storm. My point is, my illustration is that they put off the decision to flee too late. Now it's inconveniencing other people. They could have made the decision earlier, done what was probably right, and escaped uh, sooner and not inconvenienced themselves or others. But now they are. I don't know exactly how that's going to work out. And I'm sure they're glad to help them and to to care for them. It's family. You're going to do what you can. Uh, but they put off the decision. That's what I'm saying. They decided too late to escape what they heard warnings about repeatedly. That's what Felix does here in this passage. He hears the story that Paul preaches to him. The story of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you like to have heard Paul's witness of the gospel there. I'd like to hear that, wouldn't you? Mm, yeah. Here's Paul the prisoner, been beaten and left for dead more than once. Beaten many times uh, for the gospel. With the opportunity to stand here before Felix the governor. By the way, I'm say, I want to say here that all of the beatings and the difficulty that Paul went through, you and I look at it and say, wow, that's horrible. I don't want to have to go through anything like that. But because of it, Paul was able to then to be able to speak to the leaders of that nation and eventually even of Rome because of the imprisonment and the difficulty that he'd gone through and uh, that allowed him to preach the gospel to some of the most well-known uh, leading people in the entire world at that time. Mm -hmm. So the difficulty was not without reward is what I'm saying. Sometimes we see the storm and the difficulty that we have to go through and we say, God, why are you allowing us to have to suffer all of this? Why, God, is there such a storm in my life? Why do I have to suffer personally? But sometimes God has to do that in order for us to get a greater reward. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what's happening here with Paul. <coughs> he is standing there before Felix and Drusilla to be able to preach the gospel to them. Felix, of course, was a typical Roman uh, uh, a politician. He was the younger brother of the Greek freedman Marcus Antonius Pallas. Pallas and Felix, the brothers, descended from the Greek kings of Arcadia. Felix became the procurator by the petition of his brother over Caesarea. Felix's cruelty and licentiousness, that's immorality, coupled with his accessibility to bribes, 
led to a great increase of crime in Judea. How'd you like that on, on the, as a tag for your description of what you've done? He increased the crime in this area, in Judea. The period of his rule was marked by internal feuds and disturbances which he put down with severity. This was not a good man. I'm saying that to you. Felix was not a good man. He was not necessarily the model leader or even the model politician. He'd gotten his position because of people that he knew. And he did not take good advantage of it. He did not improve the area that he ruled over. He, he hurt it by his own wickedness and crime increased. And that's who Paul is preaching before. Paul gets the opportunity to go before this governor of Judea in Caesarea and to preach the gospel to him. And Felix listens to him. He hears him. He hears him out. Paul is such a popular prisoner by now that people know about him. And so Felix is interested and curious. And I want you to notice here some things about Felix. Number one, I want you to notice, as I've mentioned already, Felix was knowledgeable about the gospel. He was not ignorant. He knew about the gospel. He knew about uh, Jerusalem and, and uh, the message of Christ. He was knowledgeable about Jeruz uh, Jude Judaism. He was familiar with the Old Testament teachings of the law. And, uh, he, and yet, uh, all of that, he was not a believer. He knew of Christ. He knew of Judaism. He knew of the Old Testament. He knew of the Ten Commandments. And yet he was not a believer. Is that not like, is that also not like a lot of people in our world today? Yep. A lot of people know of the gospel, don't they? Yep. A lot of people. In fact, every time, when we went knocking on doors yesterday, everybody that I knocked on the door and talked to them and tried to witness of the gospel to them, they know of the gospel. They know of Jesus Christ being crucified on the cross. That's common for our area, common for our country, pretty much. It has been. They know, they know about it. They know about Jesus Christ being crucified on the cross. When I talk to people, that, that's one of the things they say, you know the gospel. You know about Jesus on the cross. Yes, yes, I know about that. And Felix did. He knew about it. Yeah, I want to tell you something. Felix knew not only about Jesus and the cross, he knew about the resurrection as well. All of Israel knew about the claim of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They knew about that. And even in our country, people know about that. But you know, that does not make a person a believer. There's a great difference between knowledge and belief. Is there not? A great difference between knowledge and belief. Just because you know doesn't mean you believe. Amen? Just because you know about somebody or something doesn't mean you believe in it. So many people are familiar with the gospel. They know about Christ. They may even, because of that, <clears throat> consider themselves a Christian. They may even believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They may believe that that happened. But they've never transferred that knowledge <coughs> and acceptance of that historical fact to faith in their heart. Mm -hmm. To belief in Jesus Christ. And that makes a big difference. Knowledge will get you religion. Belief will get you faith. Knowledge will get you to hell. Belief will get you to heaven. Amen. Knowledge will get you familiar with God. Belief will get you to know God. Knowledge will be accepted by men. Belief will get you accepted by God. Knowledge reaches the head. Belief reaches the heart. Big difference, amen? Yep. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that know about Jesus Christ, but they're not going to heaven. That's right. They're not born again. They're not saved. Why? Because they don't believe in Jesus the Christ. It's not transferred to their heart. That makes the difference, friend. That makes all the difference in the world. The belief of the heart. That's what is necessary to be saved. Amen. I want you to know also that Felix was curious about Paul and his gospel. He knew about this, these stories. He knew about these people, but he not only knew about it, he was curious about it. He was interested. He sent for Paul. He arranged this separate meeting with Paul and invited his wife to attend. Thought maybe she'd enjoy this as well. She would have been knowledgeable since she was a Jewess, and so they both had understanding of the Old Testament law and uh, of Jesus who, would, who had claimed to be Christ. 
And the Bible says there that they listened and reasoned with Paul concerning the faith in Christ of righteousness, temperance, which is self-control, and judgment to come. Oh, I'd like to hear Paul talk about the judgment to come, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You know what he said? You know what Paul talked about? Paul talked about the reality of hell. Yep. Amen? Mm -hmm. He talked about the fact of sin and that all of us are sinners. I don't think Felix had a problem acknowledging that. History tells us that he was very immoral and crooked. And as we see in Scripture, if you study this chapter, the Bible tells us that one of the reasons he listened to Paul because, was because he was hoping to get some money from Paul. He operated on bribes. That's the way he operated. That was, that was normal operation for him as a governor was to operate on bribes. I'm telling you something. When politicians operate on bribes, you've got a corrupt uh, a government. Amen. You've got problems. We don't need that in our country, do we? Amen? No, sir. We don't need government operating on bribes or operating based upon money. It should be based upon truth. Amen? Yeah. Amen. It should be based upon honesty and dealing in righteousness and morality. But Felix didn't have that. He wasn't that way. He was a crook. He was a crook. He was immoral. He was a cheat. He was uh, underhanded in what he did, vicious in the way he carried out his rule. And so when... Paul the Apostle comes up here and says, listen, God condemns sin. You can imagine how he described that to Felix. Mm -hmm. You're a sinner. I told a guy that yesterday while I was talking to him. All of us have sinned. The guy readily admitted that he was a sinner. Well, we all should. Amen? We all should readily admit that we're sinners. It just takes a little speck of honesty to admit that and to recognize that. We've all done things that God is displeased with. And as a result, we deserve the judgment of God for that. Paul reasoned with him on that. Felix listened to that and reasoned. Maybe he brought up some things. Maybe he countered, off, uh, uh, countered some of those arguments. I don't know, but they reasoned about it. They hashed it out. And the Bible says that Paul reasoned with him and they talked about this judgment to come. Now listen, I know that you agree with this. I, I think you do, but listen. You cannot talk about the gift of salvation from Jesus Christ was also talking about hell and the judgment of hell for those that reject it. Amen? Amen? I talked to our door knockers yesterday and I said, listen, we've got to help people understand that there's judgment of God upon sin and that judgment is hell. That's part of the soul winning plan. There's no need to get saved because there's no hell. Amen? Amen? There's no need for Christ to die on the cross if there's no hell. But there is a literal hell, and more people than not are going there, and the only escape is the salvation through Jesus Christ. And Paul yeah. reasoned with Felix on that. And I want to say to you that you and I need to be people who reason with people about righteousness and truth and judgment to come. That's what we ought to be. Amen? We as believers. How many of you agree with that? Say amen. amen. We ought to be people who reason the gospel with lost people. Paul had this private hearing and was able to describe the true faith in Christ for Felix and Drusilla. And you know what I want to say to you this morning? Listen, folks, that's the purpose of this church. You know what the purpose of this church is? The purpose of this church is to, to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ, to win people of Jesus Christ, to baptize them, and to train them to live for God and to honor God in their lives. Amen. To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. That is the purpose of the Salina Baptist. Amen. That's what we're here for. That's one of the reasons I preach and teach to you. Is so that we'll all be motivated and enabled and trained to be able to do that. To reason the gospel with people just like Paul did here with Felix. Mm -hmm. You may not have an opportunity to go before a governor. But you have the opportunity to go before your neighbor. Amen? You have the opportunity to go before your co-worker. You have the opportunity to go before a shopper in the store that you might run along uh, across and start up a conversation with. Your family members. Those people that you come across wherever you are. You and I are responsible before God to reason the Scriptures with them. You say, Preacher, I'm not very good at that. Then get good at it. Because it's the most important thing you can do as a Christian. Right. Say amen right there. Amen. It's the most important thing you can do because it is eternal. 
It matters for eternity. You and I ought to be people who understand the gospel and study it and get good at reasoning the gospel with people that we come in contact with. Reason of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. And we're good at that. The Bible says we ought to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh of us, of our faith. We need to be people ready to do that. Listen, hey, listen to me. If you're not a Christian that's ready and able to witness the gospel to lost people, you are a weak Christian and not accomplishing what you ought to for Jesus Christ. We have a soul winner's training course that can teach you the scriptures and a simple way for you to be able to learn how to share the gospel with other people. Very confident way. It's excellent. I use it. It's a, it's a system I use. Cliff has trained many people in it. You say, well, preacher, I've forgotten it. Then study it again. Amen? That is the purpose of the New Testament church. Amen. That is the purpose of you and I as believers. That's why you exist on this earth. is for God to use you to share the gospel with other people, to win them to Christ, to get them in the church, and train them to live for God. That's the Amen. purpose of the New Testament church. That's the reason you're still here on this earth. Amen. To share the gospel with other people for the glory of God. That's why we're here. That's a, if we don't accomplish that, we're failing as a church. We may get together and have a good time. We may have a great time of fellowship together. and We may even encourage each other. But listen, the bottom line is we need to be building disciples for the glory of God. That's, right. yeah. That's what our purpose is. That's what we're here for. Some nation's laws demanded that you can believe what you want, but you're not allowed to attempt to convert anybody else. There's some nations like that. You're not allowed to attempt to make converts. Well, let me ask you something. What do you think a Christian ought to do in a land like that? Huh? Iran. Iraq. It's illegal for a Christian to attempt to make a convert in that place. What do you think the Christians ought to do? I think you got to break that law, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Paul did. The Pharisees told Peter and John, we don't want you to speak anymore in his name. Remember early in the book of Acts? Yep. And they said, we can't help but speak of the things that we have Amen. seen and heard. Amen. We can't help but speak of what's been done. They violated that law. Now, I'm not, I'm not a, person that, a person that pushes violating laws. I believe we ought to obey the law. But listen, you know what they said? Peter and John, they said, we ought to obey God rather than Amen. men. God's law is higher than man's law. Yep. And it is right for believers to witness the gospel. Right. Now let me challenge you here. You ready for this? Let me challenge you this morning. Some of you work in a place where they say it's illegal for you to witness the gospel. You know what you've got to do as a Christian? You've got to break that law. You have to be a witness of the gospel for Jesus Christ. You can try to do it as discreetly as you may. You can try to ob abide the rules as much as you may, but you've got to be a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ with the chances that you get. It. I'm not saying try to get fired. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying try to go to court. I don't think you have to make the effort to do that, but you do have to make the effort of being a witness of the gospel. Are you ashamed of the gospel? I'm not ashamed of what Jesus Christ did for me. Amen? Even to the risk of our own Livelihood, comfort, acceptance, fill in the blank, whatever it may be. Paul was willing to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ even at the risk of his own life. More than that, even at the risk of his own physical well-being, he was beaten many times. Did that stop him? Did not. You and I have the responsibility, listen, you and I have the responsibility before God to be witnesses of the gospel no matter where we are, no matter the rules. We have the responsibility to be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was. Paul preached the gospel even to people that hated it. Why? Romans chapter 1 verse 16. He said he, he's going to preach the gospel of Christ no matter what. That's what God called him to do. He couldn't help it. 
And you and I are called the same way. To witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, let me tell you something. That gospel is a powerful message. Is it not? It is a powerful message. It was so powerful here that wicked Cornelius, the Bible says, shook. Look at it. Where is it? Verse number... Uh, Verse 25, there it is. You see it? Verse 25. And as he reasoned with of righteousness, temperance, and judgment come, Felix what? Tremble. Tremble. Now this is a governor with the power of Rome. An evil, uncaring individual with power. And here's one guy, this, this, this prisoner, standing there preaching him the gospel. And it shook him. The Bible says Felix trembled. I'll tell you why. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ and the conviction of God upon the heart is power. Yeah. It's power. I mean, we've got a storm brewing here in the, in the Caribbean and it's going to demonstrate some power. Let me tell you something. The power of the gospel is unlimited. It's a powerful truth. When Felix heard this message, message of truth by Paul the Apostle, the Bible says he trembled, he shook. He was so under conviction, he was literally fearful to the place of shaking. Why? He knew he was guilty. Amen? Mm -hmm. He knew he was guilty. Amen. Some may say, well, preacher, I don't think that somebody ought to, ought to get other people shook up like that. Let me tell you something. It takes a shaking up to get people to make the right decisions. That's right. Right. Amen? I mean, even the Weather Channel knows that. How many times have you heard them say on the Weather Channel, if you've watched this at all, this is a dangerous storm. What are they trying to do? They're trying to get people to make the right decision because they know it's coming. And the Gospel is powerful because of the judgment of God and the conviction of God upon sin. Felix was so under conviction, he came to the realization that he was guilty of sin before God and in line for severe judgment. Oh, he was. Is it not true that those without Christ are in line for severe judgment? Yep. I witnessed to a guy yesterday and he said, I asked him, I said, so, you say you're not sure whether you're going to heaven or hell. What if you stand before God and God says no? What if God says, sorry, you're going down? He said, well, I guess I'll just take it. I said, no, you won't. I said, the Bible says the angel will have to bind you hand and foot and cast you into hell. Hell is not a place that people are going to walk into. They're not going to take it like a man. They're going to scream and wail. The Bible says there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Amen. God does not enjoy casting people to hell, nor do I enjoy uh, talking about people having to go there, but it must be done so that they'll avoid it, so that they'll escape Amen. it. That brings conviction on people's hearts. He shook because he realized what it would mean to him to repent. He'd probably lose his position and future wealth, but would it not be worth it? Amen? Would it not be worth it? The Bible says you better do anything as to go into hell. Lose an eye, a hand, or a foot. Lose your position. Lose your wealth. Better off than going to hell. And we know that he shook because of that conviction. God help us. Listen, I, I pray that God would help us. That you and I would be such powerful witnesses of the gospel that people would shake as a result of the message. Amen. Amen. I pray for that, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. God help us. Listen, that ought to be true of our church. Yeah. That the message of this pulpit is so powerful that God would convict people to the point where they shake yeah. because of conviction. Amen. I enjoyed Amen. Brother Tom's song, this song that he sang, the first one. Mm -hmm. Amen. Such a blessing. Think of stepping on shore and finding heaven. Think of that day. Mm -hmm. That moves me emotionally to think about heaven. Think about getting there. What a, what a blessing. How awesome. I mean, you let yourself think about that for a little while. You can really get caught up in that and get emotional about it. And rejoice knowing that heaven is our home and it's not that far away. Amen. Just as you and I ought to rejoice about heaven, the lost ought to be convicted and mourn about hell. Yeah. 
so there ought to be conviction in the hearts of people. God help us that you and I would be so filled with the Spirit of God that as we witness the Gospel of Christ, that our hearts break for the lost and the lost shake and tremble at the news of the judgment of God. Amen. God help us. God help us that the message of the Gospel would have power. You say, well, where is it? I'll tell you where, the, where it is. It's in the Holy Spirit. It's there. Yeah. The problem is sometimes we just don't pray it down. Yeah. We're not right enough with God, many of us, that we don't have the power of God upon us. God forgive us. Amen? Yeah. God forgive us for being so caught up with the things of this world that we ignore the importance of the message of the Gospel to the lost world. It ought to be so powerful that people shake and weep and moan at the news of God's judgment upon their sin for eternity. God help us. Notice lastly that Felix put off this decision. What a foolish thing. He said later, when someone tells you tomorrow, what are they really saying? The answer is no. Is it? Well, I like what you're doing. I like what you say. I, I think I heard what you say, but you know, I think I'll, I'll, I'll do it later. Yeah. Yep. And they're, so they're saying no. Can I ask you a question? You're with me? Listen. Is it foolish for a lost, lost person to put off the gospel till tomorrow? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Is it foolish for a lost person to put off the gospel message and being saved till tomorrow, another day? Is that foolish? Yeah, yeah it is. Alright? I've hung you by your own rope. It's also foolish for a Christian to put off getting right with God till tomorrow. Amen? Yeah, that's right. The Bible says you're not guaranteed of another day. Yep. The time for Christians to get right with God and seek the power of God is today. Amen. Today's the day. Right. Just like it's the day for salvation, so also it is the day for righteousness and dedication and rededication to God. Not tomorrow. Not another day. Not someday down the road. Not a convenient season. Felix said a convenient season. Guess when that came? Never. Never did. Excuse me. The convenient season never came. It's foolish to put off the decision to trust Christ. It's foolish to put off the decision to get right with God. It's foolish to put off the decision to quit your sin. The golden day of opportunity is today. Tomorrow has no sure promise for any of us. The Holy Ghost cries today. The conscience cries today. The voice of reason and the voice of history and the voice of experience unite in one loud chorus and shout, Today! Today's the day. Amen. Proverbs 27, 1, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You're not guaranteed of another day. Not guaranteed of another second. Tomorrow I'll get right with God. Tomorrow I'll witness to that person. Tomorrow I'll do what's right. No, you won't. You're putting it off. You're saying no to today. James chapter 4, verse 13. Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. We're not guaranteed of another moment. <coughs> when God convicts you, you ought to respond to God's conviction immediately. Today is the day of salvation. I read the story of a man and his wife who had gone out for a swim at an out-of-the-way beach on Lake Michigan. They were sitting and talking about his work and planning a new home so they could care for their children in a better way. The man had just recently received a good job and things were looking up for the family. The man's name, David Lancaster, he stood up and dived off a rocky ledge into the water of Lake Michigan. When he did so, his entire life changed. His head hit the bottom. He surfaced in a sitting position, unable to move his legs. His wife screamed and yelled for help. Some people finally came and they carried the 26-year-old man onto the beach. He couldn't move his legs nor the lower part of his right arm. 
and carried him off to the hospital and the doctors sadly announced that he was paralyzed and for the rest of his life he would be in complete paralysis. His life changed in just a moment. And listen, Amen. our lives can change in just a moment. To put off the decision for God is a foolish thing. To say that you're going to get better tomorrow. To say that you're going to get saved tomorrow. To say that you're going to get right with God tomorrow. To say that you're going to do the right things or witness the gospel to somebody else tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. Tomorrow's the fool's day. Today is the day. A poor wretch came into a preacher's office drunken from his booze. His life ruined and wasting. His health fading away. The preacher said, Aren't you going to stop your drinking and turn to Christ? The man replied, oh, there's nothing else that I can do. I will. And the preacher said, then do it today. Let's do it today. He hung his head and said, not now, tomorrow. And tomorrow never came. Of course, tomorrow never does come. <coughs> Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to get right with God. Today is the day to serve God. Today is the day to be the witness for Jesus Christ that God's called you to be. Today is the day to quit your sin and get right with God and get back in the service for the Lord. Don't put it off. The storm's coming. You better make the decision now while you have the chance. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How many of you here say, Preacher, I know without a doubt that I've already made the decision to be saved. I've trusted Christ. I know that Jesus is my Savior, heaven my home, and I'm thankful to God for that. How many of you can raise your hand as a testimony of that? Yes, preacher, I'm saved and I know it. Thank you. God bless you. That's great. We can put them down. How many this morning say, preacher, I'm not sure about that? I've not made that decision yet, but I know I need to. I know that today is the day I ought to decide for Jesus Christ to be saved. Preacher, I'm concerned about that. Pray for me. How many like that this morning? Slip up your hand, would you? Preacher, pray for me. I've not yet made that decision, but preacher, I'm concerned about it. I know I need to today. Preacher, pray for me. Any like that with heads bowed and eyes closed? All right, let me ask you this. How many this morning say, Preacher, I know I'm saved. I know that. I know I'm a Christian. But preacher, I'm not right with God like I should be. And I've been putting it off. I've been thinking I'll get it one day. One of these days I'll get right with God. One of these days I'll quit this sin. One of these days I'll rededicate my life to the Lord. One of these days I'll get back to winning, witnessing for Christ. And you know today's the day. Today's the day that you need to get right with God. You know that God's convicted you. And you know it. Today's the day you need to get that done. How many like that this morning? Slip up your hand, would you? Preacher, pray for me. I know I need to get right with God today. I know I need to quit my sin today. Or I know, preacher, that I need to become the witness that I should be today. Preacher, I'm concerned about that. Pray for me. Slip up your hand, would you? While heads are bowed and eyes closed. Preacher, pray for me today. I've been putting it off. I've been waiting. I've been thinking I'll do it one of these days soon. I'll get back into witnessing for Christ. I'll become a soul winner again. I'll get dedicated to God again. But I've been putting it off. And preacher, I know I need to do it today. How many like that this morning? Slip up your hand, would you? Preacher, pray for me. I know it. I know I need to do it today. Pray for me. God bless you. How many others? Preacher, pray for me. Today's the day. Slip up your hand, would you? Let me pray for you. I'm going to call out your name. I won't embarrass you. You know that. Preacher, remember me in prayer. How many others? Slip it up right now. Preacher, today's the day for me to get right with God. I know it. I need to. I need to quit putting it off. I need to let the devil, uh, quit letting the devil talk me into tomorrow. The devil keeps reminding me I can do it another day. And preacher, I've not done it. I know today's the day I need to do it. Preacher, pray for me. How many like that this morning? Slip up your hand, would you? Preacher, pray for me. Real quick, with heads bowed, nice clothes. Any more? All right, let's stand together, please, and I'll pray. And they bow and eyes closed. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning praying, God, that you bless this invitation. I thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that you give us in your word of acting upon your conviction immediately. 
Felix did not. And as far as we know, we never got saved. God, I pray that you'd help us not to make that same foolish mistake. For those here that are lost, help them to come and be saved. For those not right with God, help them to come and rededicate their lives to God, to quit their sin. For those not soul winners as they should be, God, help them to come and dedicate themselves to being now the soul winner that they should be. Help us, Lord. Bless this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me have